From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Now, I'm no great scholar of the classics, but in Homer's Odyssey, Mentor was chosen by his friend Odysseus to take care of his son Telemachus when Odysseus goes off to fight in the Trojan War. It is from Mentor's guidance and his relationship with Telemachus that Latin, English, and other languages have all adopted the term mentor as it's known today, someone who inspires and shares knowledge or wisdom with someone younger or less experienced. I'm reminded of that, too, having just finished the first season of The Last of Us on HBO, based on the wildly popular video game from Naughty Dog and Sony Interactive Entertainment. That's NYSC, ticker symbol S-O-N-Y. Now, in the game and also in the show, the orphan girl Ellie comes under the wing of this big brother figure, Joel, as they make their way from Boston to Wyoming, with their relationship blossoming through their harrowing journey out west. And as they reach their ultimate destination, we're left to wonder, really, Who's benefited more from the mentorship, Ellie or Joel? It falls in line with the philosophy espoused by our guest today, Artis Stevens, president and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, who was recently my guest on the podium of the New York Stock Exchange to ring the closing bell. As Artis has said, a young person ends up making more of an impact on mentors' lives. Now, anyone who's been a mentor is familiar with this. It's sort of a form of reverse mentoring. While mentorship has its roots in ancient Greek mythology, the idea of reverse mentoring is relatively new, where someone younger or less experienced mentors someone more senior. Mentoring or reverse mentoring, it's a two-way relationship, organic or inorganic. Regardless, mentoring benefits everyone involved, and today we're lucky to have artists here to tell us how mentoring can positively impact the mentor the mentee, their communities, and the world beyond. Our conversation with Artis Stevens on his unexpected career path and the role the the largest mentoring organization in the country is playing, that's all coming up right after this. Shopify Editions is back with over 100 product updates and enhancements all in one place. Explore our latest solutions for every aspect of commerce, from starting and scaling a business so you can sell everywhere easier, to flexible components for enterprise needs. Businesses can choose which technologies they need to create the customer experience they want. And developer tooling to customize any commerce experience. We know how important it is to offer the right mix of power, flexibility, and customization across our surfaces. No matter what you're building, you can build for the long term with Shopify. Visit shopify.com slash additions. Our guest today, Artis Stevens, is the president and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. Prior to his current role, Artis served as senior vice president and chief marketing officer of the National 4-H Council, Before that, spent 13 years at the Boys and Girls Clubs of America in various roles, including National Vice President, Marketing Strategy and Operations, Education and Program Planning. Artis began his career at the Brunswick and Atlanta Housing Authorities as Director of Marketing and Community Relations. Welcome, Artis, Inside the Ice House. Josh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Great to talk with you again as well. So, as we mentioned in the introduction, you and I were both at the New York Stock Exchange earlier this year to celebrate National Mentoring Month. How did it feel to be up there in the podium ringing the closing bell? Wow, Josh, it was surreal. <laughs> I, I, there are very few things I've experienced in, uh, like that, that this moment of being at the nexus of just economy, right? What, what's happening in our world, the, the leading companies and businesses uh, in the world and the impact that they're making in so many different ways. And to see our mission and see our brand and the work that we do, right? The connection point of that, it was 
incredible to experience myself, but it was also incredible to have uh, some of our young people right there ringing the bell with me and some of our littles, what we, we call our young people that we serve, uh, right there ringing the bell and their first experience being on the stock exchange floor. And I was also just proud to have my family, my wife and my two girls there as well. So it was a moment for me and my friend. Littles on either side of us, including your family artists, what kind of feedback did you get after it? They want to do it again. <laughs> 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 yeah. And, and that said something, right? That uh, I remember my youngest daughter, she told me, she said, this won't be my last time up here. Right. And that just stuck with me. Because just as you talked about with your story, you know, when you first sort of uh, started off talking about this segment, is that the idea of mentorship, how powerful it is, is that exposure, right? You expose a young person to something really incredible, really exciting, something that gives them uh, a new look or an affirmed look on life. And then hopefully what happens from that is there's this ripple effect that happens in their life to say, hey, I can do it, I can be it, and then I can contribute that uh, as well. So to hear my daughter say that, uh, it's a reflection of what we do in this organization and what Big Brothers Big Sisters is all about. As I said that day, and bears repeating for our listeners, Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, really over a century old. Can you tell us about how the organization got its start and how it's transformed over the years? It really did start right here in New York City, didn't it? That's right. So it started in uh, New York City uh, 119 years ago, actually. And the reason it started, and this is really an, important for your listeners, because it, it says so much about this country. It started because there was this court clerk, right? There were kids being sent through the juvenile justice system. Uh, and a court clerk, a guy named Ernest Coder at the time in New York City, said there has to be a better way than kids coming through the court system. And then he came with this idea, well, what if we connected kids with positive adults in their lives, right? And gave them stewardship. Now, most of these kids, Josh, were kids who were homeless. They were in street gangs. They, many of them were immigrants coming into the country for the first time. Right. So this was innovation. This was innovation. And it wasn't innovation that just happened alone by Ernest's idea, but it was about communities coming together. So the reason why this program has grown over a century to be the largest uh, mission driven mentoring organization in the country is because of corporations, because of academia, because of government. But everyone's saying we got skin in the game, that we have to build partnerships because when we do it well, it not only impacts kids, but kids then go on to contribute to society and contribute in productive ways. So that's why when you think about mentorship in this country today, why it's so important, our history tells us that when we come together and do amazing things, that we not only change kids' lives, but we can change the direction of our country. Yeah, changing the direction of the country and also changing the direction of these individual people, including, you know, its leader. Let's talk about your own origin story, artists. You talk about often your childhood growing up in Brunswick, Georgia from a young age. Did you think that you'd follow in your father's and grandfather's footsteps and actually become a preacher? That's a really great question. Uh, my, my dad, my dad's a preacher, as, as you just stated, and my granddad. So I had this line going on. It was like, man, do, do I have to be a preacher like 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 you guys as well? Um, and I came from a large family. And I always remember because my mom and dad used to always say, you know, we didn't have a lot of means growing up, but we were rich in relationships. Right. That was the context. That was the fabric of our society ecosystem and the people around us. Uh, and I remember going to my dad and I said, hey, do I need to be a preacher like you? And I'll never forget what my dad said, because it's been really the guiding principle in my life that everyone has their ministry in this world and you have to find yours, right? And that gave me this sense of empowerment, right? To find and, and, and follow my own direction, still following the ministry, but not in the same way that he did. But what was the real key component to every step in my life and growing up was this community of people that was around me, right? And they were family, but they were not all related to me by blood, right? But they were family. And they helped me to be the first in my family to go to school and, and, and go to college and graduate. Uh, it was the people who gave me the, the nudge that I needed in terms of making really critical decisions in my life. And that's what we all need. And sometimes it can be taken from granted, the people in your life and the support system in your life. But it's unfortunately what too many kids don't have. And it's access, it's opportunities, it's connection to these types of relationships that can really be meaningful and impactful to their direction. Did any of the siblings uh, follow in the family business? <laughs> well, my, my oldest brother ended up becoming a musician in the church. So he was a minister of music, uh, if you will. But yeah, it, it, I, I was the youngest of a really large family. 
all of us had some level of, of different talent. Uh, mine certainly wasn't in the, that type of ministry or where a lot of my, my siblings went in terms of singing uh, musical uh, careers. I had none of that talent at all. I just uh, happened to, to have a lot of good people around me to push me. Uh, and I was excited to, to do the work in terms of empowering young people in this country. Beyond mom and dad, beyond siblings, who are some of the mentors that really were impactful on you growing up outside of the home? One was my uh, middle school grade teacher. Uh, his name was Mr. Arrington. Uh, and I'll never forget Mr. Arrington because he was one of the smartest people. He was actually, my dad was one of the smartest people I knew, but my dad never went to college, right? So I didn't have anyone in my life that was that model for me of higher education. Mr. Arrington was the first person that I met that was a man of color uh, who had went to college. And it was my embodiment of, okay, and seen this before. So it, he told me something. He you know, had a lot of friends. There were a lot of things going on in our community uh, at the time. And he said, uh, you know, the most powerful thing that a man can hold in his hand is not a gun, but a book, right? And it was the power of knowledge, right? And the understanding of knowledge and using knowledge as this positive weapon to create, you know, positive change in society. And those types of things stuck with me. You know, I'll also say when I graduated from college, uh, I thought I was going to law school, right? So you could have been talking to me, Josh, here as a lawyer. <laughs> but um, uh, what happens when I, I graduated, I went back home and I did some interviews just to, to have some fun doing some practice interviews. And I met uh, who became a mentor, a man who became a mentor in my life. And he took me to a public housing community in the interview. And he said, what do you know about this playground in the public housing community? And I smiled and I laughed and I said, this is the uh, playground that I played in as a kid when I was growing up. He said, you can always go to law school, son, but you can't always come back home and change your community. Um, and it stuck with me. And that was my first job. My first job was working in public housing, the public housing community that I played in as a kid. I had the opportunity to come back home and then help to transform that community. That's mentorship, right? That's the circle, what we all see and we see in our lives and the powerful change that happens. When you did get out of the University of Georgia and you did come back to Brunswick and you looked around at what was happening at the Brunswick Housing Authority. What were the major issues back then? I mean, you know, what were the, its biggest challenges? Yeah, you know, a lot of it was economic, right? So the idea of um, you had a lot of families who were struggling and, 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 and you know, back then, you know, the perception was, oh, well, it's, it's public housing and, you know, people are not doing, doing well, not doing what they need to do. It was a lot of families just working hard, but just didn't have access, didn't have opportunities, didn't have the connection uh, that they needed. And it was coming into those types of places that sort of get a leg back up, right? Sometimes what we need in this country. And, and this sort of comes really full circle to even the conversation what we're talking about on the, the stock exchange floor, that what I was able to do at that point in time, and it taught me so much, was to bring together two communities. One community is where all of these hardworking families who were looking for jobs, who were looking for ways to give their kids exposure, opportunity, uh, much more success in life. And then the business community, who were looking for a pipeline, a workforce, people to do certain things. And you had all these families who just didn't have the avenue, the connection, sometimes the training and the development. Well, my first job was hoping to bring those two communities together. And I'll never forget sitting at a table and having on one side of the table, all of these families who are hardworking families, but just needed opportunity, but was living in poverty in a lot of cases. And on the other side, employers, right? Bankers, right? Finance people, other industries, hotel, tourism, and then all these people coming together to talk about how can we design programs that help give people a step up, right? Not a handout, but a step up in opportunity. And that really shaped and framed my perspective in my career going forward. And yet you didn't stay out of the classroom forever, artists. I mean, you didn't go, end up going to law school, but you did go to Valdosta State to study public administration. What prompted you to go back and get that second degree? It was the sense that to continue to grow, to continue to excel, to continue to be everything that I know my parents won and all of the people that had helped me uh, to, to continue this journey and thrive in my life, it was to continue to get better. I've, I've always been curious, right? It's back to that, that, that story I shared about my middle school teacher about the power of the book, right? 
always been curious to know more, to learn more, to understand more. Uh, and I felt that urge to go back and, and to get more education uh, to better myself, to strengthen myself. I felt like I needed, you know, stronger executive skills uh, as well. And that was a really key part. It wasn't just the idea of doing and executing, but it was like, how do I become a better executive? Decision making, judgments, understanding, reading and understanding things logistically, budgets, right? It's things that, you know, you don't always get the type of training, even sometimes at, at your, your basic level of college that you need more refined training. And then what masters, getting my masters allowed me to do, and particularly while I was working, was apply it at the same time, right? So I wasn't just in the school setting, I was in the work and career session setting. So then I was able to connect that to what I was learning in school and, and apply vice versa uh, to things that I was learning both in my career while I was also getting my education uh, for public administration. So you had this this experience at the Brunswick Housing Authority under your belt. You, you got your your master's at Valdosta State. Then you're coming out. And, and when did you first become aware of what the Boys and Girls Clubs of America were doing? And how did you start working for that organization? So, Josh, the I tell people this all the time. The only real interview, meaning that I actually and, and, it, and it, I'll say I say this sort of um, jokingly, but it's actually there's truth in it. The, the only real interview that I've ever done, meaning I actually submit in myself uh, for my own initiative, submitted for a job interview in my entire career was that first job. Only one. And the reason why I say that is not to brag on myself. It's, it's really to, to say the power of mentorship, right? The power of relationships. So the reason why I moved on to Boys and Girls Clubs was because at the Brunswick Housing Authority, and then when I moved over to the Atlanta Housing Authority, through a relationship, someone who saw me at the Brunswick Housing Authority made a connection, ended up moving there because they recruited me and reached out. Um, I ended up uh, generating uh, a multi-million dollar investment in Atlanta public housing communities through youth programs. So Boys and Girls Clubs and those types of things. And it was a, a person at Boys and Girls Clubs who said, hey, we're going to stay connected with you. And at some point, I'm going to call you about an opportunity. And he did. He ended up calling me about an opportunity. And I said, yeah, I said, I I'm interested. What kind of marketing, fundraising, public-private partnership roles that you have? And he said, none. <laughs> I said, what? He said, uh, the role that I have is program. And I said, program? I said, I mean, I grew up in like youth programs, but that's not where my, my, my education, my background and experience. And then he said, listen, to ultimately market, promote and sell uh, this, this program, you got to understand it. You got to understand about working it. Right. And I will tell you that it was five to six years of the best time of my career because I learned things that I would have that pushed me, that stretched me that I was not comfortable about at all. And it helped me to grow and understand how do you form national programs, education programs, outcomes and measurements. And then another, another little small thing happened is while I was there in that program department, I met my wife <laughs> as well. So there was a lot that came out and some really incredible outcomes from that experience. What is the void artist that's inside our country's homes that makes Boys and Girls Clubs, 4-H and Big Brothers, Big Sisters so vital? What are their unique niches that they do differently from one another and to solve the problems that, that we can't solve at home? Yeah. Well, if you think about what's happening in our country, right, you know, you have about uh, the 50 million school age kids, right? You have about a third of those kids who don't have access to uh, after school programs, right? Who are sometimes considered that term latchkey kids, right? Would go home and, and it's not always because the parent doesn't want to be there. It's because the parent may be working or it may be a, a single led family household, right? So mom or dad or grandpa or grandma, right? Or leading the family, but they can't be all places at one time and can't afford a childcare system. So one of the most powerful things about our country is we always have had that type of social net, right? To support communities, to support families. And that's why these uh, organizations are all important. We were all founded around the same time because of that social net in the earliest part of the 20th century, right? So if you think about Boys and Girls Clubs, it's a building, it's a actual facility that provides after school programming for kids to create safe and productive environments. If you think about 4-H, 4-H has always been anchored on serving kids, even though it reaches a lot of kids in a lot of communities, 
But a, a lot of kids who don't get access and reach to a lot of services in rural communities, rural and small, smaller size communities. And 4-H has been that agricultural rural program for so many uh, a number of years. And then when you think about the organization that I'm at, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, right? The idea that there is 15 million kids in this country who don't have access to a positive mentor in their life, right? 15 million kids in this country that don't have access to a positive mentor outside of their family in their life, right? And that's something that I believe every kid deserves, not just from my personal story, but we know if there's one fundamental thing in humankind that has helped us to continue to grow, thrive, and develop, it's been the idea of teaching, teaching from one generation to the next, the next, right? That's who we are as human beings. So to me, mentoring is not this sort of, hey, it's a good thing to have. It's a necessity to our lives in the same way that we eat, we breathe, we do different things. We need that to feed our souls, to feed our growth, and to feed our development. So I don't only see, and I don't, I not only see ourselves as a youth empowerment organization, I see, our, I see ourselves as a vital organization to human development. Before we go to the break, what kind of communication, what kind of a relationship can a mentor have to a mentee that a father or mother can't have to a kid? What kind of things can they say, can they do, can they act on? A lot of it's being supportive, right? And it's, 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 sometimes it's affirmation, right? It's affirmation because in a lot of cases, what we see in our, our what we call bigs and littles, so bigs for us are positive adults, the littles are the young people that are connected in our relationship. In a lot of cases, it's a affirmation. A lot of times you see that sometimes kids want an affirmation from someone outside the home, right? Mm -hmm. And that's important to have in their life. Sometimes it is because kids feel like they can't have certain conversations inside the home. Uh, and we've all experienced that. There are certain things your kids are going to tell you, right? And there are other things your kids are not going to tell you, right? So the mentor becomes sort of an outlet, right? To be a, a positive support in that ways. And particularly for some of the communities that we serve. Right. When you think about that, we serve a number of kids that uh, are in the LGBTQ plus community. Right. We know that 50 percent of the kids that we serve in the LGBTQ plus community come out to their big and haven't come out to their parent. Right. That says something that says something about the power of the mission and the work that that we do, because it's important that signals trust. Right. And the trust of those relationships that a kid who feels very vulnerable in terms of expressing something about themselves to their family feels more comfortable about expressing it to a mentor in their life, right? That's the power of the, the program and the importance that we have. And those are the relationships that continue to be established. And I'll say this to sort of wrap, wrap you know, put a bow on this, Josh, is that the other thing I think is really important is that whatever we do, it's never an idea of replacing a parent, right? Mm. Like a big is not, a mentor is not intended to replace a parent. That's the primary relationship in a child's life. What we hopefully will do is provide another avenue for kids to have a supportive avenue because we believe in the concept of a village, right? And that's when I talk about the ecosystem. So many of us remember that we were not just, we don't just look to one person so many of us who've, who've had success, who've had uh, positive and healthy development, we can look to a community of people, different mentors, different people in our lives, right? And we believe that every single young person deserves a community of people in their lives. And that's why we believe the service and the work that we do is so important. Mentors in your lives after the break, Arta Stevens, the president and CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, and I are going to dive into BBBS and how he's making history at the helm. That's all coming up right after this. When you hear the word sustainability, you think too big. When you feel you have to do something, you think too complicated. Hold on. Think about your decisions. Get closer. Those that are big or small for you, your decisions and other people's decisions, those that have to be made every day. Step back a little. Think of the decisions that add up to many more. There are millions of decisions that change everything, little by little, for the better. Now think about who can help you make better decisions. And there we are. So that what you save, the planet saves too. To keep moving forward without leaving anyone behind. 
And now, when you hear the word sustainability, you think opportunities. At BBVA, we're putting new solutions at your fingertips in order to build a greener and more inclusive future. BBVA, creating opportunities. Welcome back. Before the break, I was talking to Artis Stevens, the president and CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, about his early beginnings and his career leading up to his current role. So Artis, as I mentioned, you made history about two years ago by becoming the first black CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, really just as the world was in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. How did the pandemic impact your role, the organization, and its programming? It's really harder to mentor when you're wearing a mask, isn't it? Yeah, it's harder to mentor when you're wearing a mask, and it's harder to mentor when you are socially isolated, right? That's what I came into when I started the organization in early 2021. So it was at the height of the pandemic. The pandemic. It was uh, January 2021 when I started. And what I remember is as a leader, it was challenging because you had a few things that were going on. One, social isolation. You had schools that were closed down. So when schools closed down, a lot of our services, of course, mm. were affected. So we couldn't operate. We couldn't directly provide services. Uh, to young people and to, to to kids and families in the way that they they needed it at the time. Uh, as a leader coming into the organization, I could meet with the the staff that I was intended to lead, right? Uh, both uh, nationally, but also because we have 230 local affiliates uh, on the ground in communities that serve 5,000 communities. You know, I couldn't meet with any of them, right? So all of my interactions were via a video screen. It was via Zoom. Um, and that was challenging, right? It was challenging both professionally, but it was also challenging personally for me because I wanted to be connected coming into a job and leading into a job and understanding the mission, understanding the organization more effectively. So there were a number of different dynamics that were going on, but most importantly, the dynamic was that kids were, were facing struggles and facing issues, right? Mental health challenges, uh, academic challenges. We were seeing that probably more than than typical groups and organizations because of the populations we serve, right? So 55% of the kids that we serve uh, are live in poverty. Another 60% uh, are led by a single, a single family household. We have about 20% of the kids that we serve uh, have a family member that's incarcerated and parole. And what I tell people all the time, none of those numbers, none of those numbers define who they are. But what often defines them or challenges them is the context that they that they find themselves in in their environments. And what often helps support them is the relationships in their lives. So part of what we needed to do is to say, how do we help young people who already were facing challenges before the pandemic and the pandemic did nothing but exasperate those challenges? So how do we provide services? We had to pivot. We had to pivot like most organizations during that time. So. When we couldn't go face to face, what did we do? We said that we were still going to help kids with things like homework help, uh, still be mentoring. So we were in front yards. We were six feet apart in front yards with masks, with our volunteers and our staff and young people and their families talking. We delivered food. And that's something we had never done before. But we said, you know what? We have volunteers. We got staff. We got cars. But our families need to eat. So we delivered food and we became a food, a food distribution network. Right. So we understood the assignment being we had to help kids and we had to help families in any way that we could. We helped set up Wi-Fi in certain communities with mobile Wi-Fi systems so that kids could pick up Wi-Fi. It was really being present and showing up for our families in ways that we needed to show up. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say to, to your question that that may lead to a question down the road here is it also made us think about during all this time how important it was for us to think about our services, how important it was for us to think about how we delivered services and not just being in the pandemic, but even beyond the pandemic, how we needed to make sure that our services was truly meeting kids and families where they were and not the other way around so that we could be more adaptable and more flexible in how we were able to impact kids and impact the communities we serve. When you joined as CEO artists, in addition to all that, you created something called the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, or JEDI, to use the acronym, Advisory Council. What inspired that move? 
Yeah, it, it was back to our founding, right? When I had mentioned to you about Ernest Coder and, and being found from the juvenile justice system, uh, we had always been an organization that had a very centered view around uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. You know, I tell people this all the time. We were founded from the justice system, the juvenile justice system, with the very focus of creating more equity in the kids' lives that we serve, and particularly kids who were most marginalized at the time that I had mentioned earlier. The way we grew was through diverse communities coming together. It was the church. It was businesses. It was academia. It was government, right? But it was diverse communities from every walk of life, every background, every demographic who said, we're going to come together in smaller communities, larger communities, and we're going to help to create Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And that's how we scaled over a number of years. And the entire emphasis of that work and that focus was also always about kids feeling included right? And having a sense of inclusion and belonging so that they had a pathway to be successful in life. You put all those things together, justice, right? Equity, diversity, inclusion, Jedi. That's why we call ourselves a Jedi-focused uh, youth empowerment organization, not to grab onto a new headline or to the, the latest thing that's out or being said today, but because it's 119 years of our DNA and who we are as an organization and who we'll continue to be in terms of serving the kids who need us the most and making sure that we're providing positive relationships that create connection in their lives. At the core, I guess, artists still is that basic human connection between two people. For people who have heard of Big Brothers, Big Sisters, maybe they know someone who serves as a big or they know someone who, a little who could use a big. What's the process like to match a big with a little? How long does the process take? What resources are required? Yeah. So most of it is, first of all, a, a, a potential a big, a volunteer raising their hand and saying that I want to want to be a big. Right. Um, and that that's important. Right. I can't stress how important that is, Josh. Right now, we got 30,000 kids on our waiting list. You didn't hear that number wrong. That's right. 30,000 it's kids. It's a lot of people. 30,000 kids on our waiting list. We need more more people raising their hands to become mentors. Most of those kids on our waiting list. Um, our boys, and we need certainly all walks of life, all people, but we certainly need more men uh, coming to the table. Uh, typically, what happens is someone raises their hand and say, I want to be become involved in the, the program. We take them through um, a process. Uh, that process, it really depends on uh, the mentor and how engaged uh, they are in the process. I mean, it can take anywhere from like a, you know, a, a month, a couple of months. Uh, to just go through things like background checks, right? You know, getting references. We are very, I will tell you, we're very intentional about this process, right? And the reason we are is because you're talking about the safety of young people. Mm -hmm. You're talking about also the safety of our volunteers. We want everyone to feel like they came into the right experience. So we want that connection, what we call the match, right? So that one-to-one -one connection or one-to-group connection to really be powerful and to really be sustainable. We go through a lot of process. So the one thing we're going to do is we're going to understand more about you. We're going to understand more about the family that we would connect you with so that that connection feels right and it feels authentic. Uh, you typically will meet with uh, what, a little two times a month. I will tell you that every single one of our bigs comes into this and says, yeah, two times a month. That seems about right. Uh, then they come back to us and say, I want to meet more. <laughs> right? So it always starts that way. It's like a, it's like an, it's basically two hours, right? You're saying an hour, uh, you know, each visit. And it turns into these really spectacular, incredible relationships. One thing that we do is uh, our program is really robust in terms of what we call support, match support. That means that, Josh, you came into our program and we match you with uh, a little. We're not going to leave you. Right. We're going to be that match support for you when you have questions or Here's resources or, or you're looking for things, uh, conversations to have, right? Here's how you start a conversation, right? But most of the time, the little drives it, right? Uh, so they get together and the big and the little, they create what you call, we call a youth development plan. So they'll create a plan together and it's the young person leading the way, you know, big ask some question, but the young person leads and talks about what they want to achieve out of a relationship. The big does the same thing. And then all of a sudden, magic happens, right? These, these magic uh, relationships, our tenure of our relationships formally typically happens, uh, lasts about three and a half years formally. And I say formally because a lot of times it goes up to the age of 18. Yeah. What we see though, is that these relationships are 30, 40 years. You have uh, littles and bigs who 
end up being the 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 big ends up being in the little wedding, right? That it, it's so long and so tenured because of the real nature of family and extended family and connection that it has. A lot of littles have gone on to go to do great things. What are some of the the sort of really emblematic stories that you hear of of how a, a relationship resulted in you know life changing opportunity for a little? Yeah. So we we have tons of them. I'll tell you some of the ones that uh, really speak to me. Uh, we we have one last week. So we have uh, what we call an alumni hall of fame, where we bring uh, some of our most prominent alumni, whether you were a little or where you were a, a big, uh, t- uh, together and to engage. And one of the most powerful ones that I, that I heard was from a judge. Uh, so this this judge, and he said um, his he was a little at the time. And his mentor made an incredible difference in his life. And the mentor uh, took him basically across a river. And it was a river that was frozen at the time. I don't know how safe that was at the time, but people did it like uh, often at the time he was a kid. And uh, what was so powerful about that story is he linked it back to the history of his family, right? And the what he didn't know was that that was part of the story of historically where um, how a lot of slaves at the time escaped um, going through a frozen river, those little walk over that r- river uh, to help to get to their freedom. Um, and, you know, it was so powerful hearing that story because he remembers it now being a judge. He remembers it as an idea of why it helped to expose him to this idea of justice, uh, this idea of freedom, right? And even now in his career, what he does in his career was so emblematic to the sense of how that relationship helped his life to unfold, right? And I I say that example, I share that example because it is such a symbol of what these relationships truly aspire to. They aspire to this sense of exposure for young people to see things and to become exposed to things. We know about 90% of our kids uh, get a career exposure because of our program, right? A career exposure they hadn't had before because of our program. We know that about 86% of our kids are on track to graduate and attend college because of the relationship that they have with their mentorship that is supportive in the school environment as well. That's not by accident. That's by intention of this mission and the program and the work that thousands of volunteers do locally in community in connection with kids that's really critical and important for life. What are the metrics you use to know that signal to yourself that, hey, this relationship is working? More importantly, how do you know when a relationship isn't working with Mm -hmm. 230 agencies operating across the country in all locales, creating standards? And and so what do you do about it when you see that, you know, maybe this match is not quite right? Yeah, well, in terms of when we know it is working, right, the relationship, one of the things that we do, we believe a lot in measurement, right? So we're an evidence-based program. We've done uh, 119 years. We have 119 years, of course, of anecdotal outcomes, but also just uh, measurement and research, right? Evaluation studies, right? We've been uh, an, an organization that's been one of the gold standards in terms of evaluation and impact of our program and our outcomes, and we are continuously uh, in that focus in the work. And we have a measurement program directly to young people, to families, to the volunteers as well. So that in real time, we see how the relationship is going and we're able to evaluate the relationship. Here's what we look at. We look at is, is what we call intensity of relationship, meaning is there a level of engagement activity that's going on? The tenures of the relationship, is the relationship lasting? Are people meeting? Are there milestones or things that are happening that way? That's why the match support that we provide is so important uh, and engaging. Are we listening to what young people are telling us, right? Uh, and hearing their voice uh, and are they feeling good, emotionally connected? And are we seeing outcomes, right? So, you know, we look at uh, really uh, some core outcomes. One, uh, academic success and how young people are doing ac- academically, right? We're not the only answer to that, but are the mentoring relationship being supportive to their academic success? Are we asking questions? Are we being supportive in the environment? Their mental health is another area that we look at. Are they not getting involved and in staying using proactive and pro-social um, supportive uh, uh, activities and choices? So positive decisions, not getting involved in things that would be risky behaviors is another key part. And then do they have the sense of emotional connection to the environment and communities around them, contributing service 
those types of things. So we look at those kind of models. Here's Josh when we know it's not working. We hear directly from young people um, or our volunteers that the level of engagement uh, is not there, right? When we see that the sense of the relationship, there are ebbs and flows. Sometimes there's movement that happens in a relationship either from a big or a little where they're transitioning uh, to another location, geography, which sometimes causes relationships uh, to not to last as long as we like. Um, but what I will tell you is that we are really good at intervening when we see those types of things to try to self uh, correct those types of things uh, with the relationship. And if there is a challenge, what we typically do is we come in, we help to basically provide support to a transition to another relationship. That is the rare, that is a rare situation in our model. Um, and it's not uh, because of anything that I do. It's because of the incredible work of our local staff and agencies on the ground who are experts at this work, who do a lot of, of good, intense work and background. Because the last thing we want to happen is an adult get, it, get into a young person's life. And then that, that adult, whatever reason, leaves that young person's life, particularly when they haven't had it in the first place. So that's why the upfront work of what we do and then the, the constant support and match support is so important in these relationships. About a year ago, Mackenzie Scott really stepped up with a donation of more than $120 million to Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America. Now, a lot has been written about her unique approach to philanthropy and how she's doing it. But what does a donation of that size really mean to your organization and how do you put it to use? Yeah, $122.6 million. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. I didn't um, mention the 2.6, but you know, every yeah, dollar counts, yeah. man. Every dollar, my friend. It is, so it, 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 it's, it's an infusion, right, into our network. It's an infusion. 30, 30 local agencies uh, got funding from that amount in, in addition to our national office. Uh, what's really important about that is here's why that, and, and, and I love to talk about here, talk about this because here's why that money is so important. I just got finished telling you and, 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 and your listeners about how our program operates and work, right? What I didn't share with you, which is really important, is that the families we serve, they don't, play a, they don't pay a penny for our program. We don't charge them a cent. It's 100% free to our families because they couldn't access this program if they were charged for it, right? So to be able to serve and provide free services, right? All the things I to told you about, the background checks, the technology that it, it takes to do matches, the support, the capacity on the ground, the training for staff, those things cost money. And those are not always the things that you find investment from, from people because a lot of times you want to fund the, here's the great scholarship or the program or a specific thing, but not always the things that are under the hood that helps organizations to thrive and grow. We call it unrestricted, right? Unrestricted funding, which means it allows us to take money and use it in a way that's best fits and, and serves the organization. It's trust-based philanthropy. That's what Mackenzie Scott gift did for us. It allowed that trust, allowed us to invest in places where our organization needs opportunity and needs growth. And that's what we're hoping to continue to build in the type of work that we're doing. So where's that money being invested now? We basically took the money that she invested in us nationally and our 30 agencies said, hey, we want to raise our hands to reinvest back nationally as well. So that not only 30 agencies impact from this, but 230 agencies get impact from this. So we created a fund that's now allowing us to deploy our strategic plan to build better and stronger training, to bring more volunteers into our network. So now we're launching a comprehensive volunteer experience program that helps to train our staff on the ground and help us train and support volunteers to come into our network. Right? We're going to be able to build a larger alumni network, right? So we got 20 million alumni, 20 million that's out there. Our challenge is that we don't know all their names, you know, and we need help in terms of getting people to identify to say, hey, I was a big, I was a little, or my, my child was in the program, or I supported the program in this way. We want to bring those people back into our communities to help us to raise money, to help us to advocate, to help us support uh, the work that we're doing. So that's going to be critical to what we do and how we grow and move forward. And then that's the third thing, growth, right? Growth to reach more kids. And one of the things that we're seeing right now is that we're growing a lot of different ways in our, in our program. Uh, we traditionally serve 5 to 18 
And we're going to continue to go deep in serving Kids 518 with a lot of different programs in technology, in education, in any types of mentorship. But our fastest growing population that we're serving since the pandemic is 18 to 25 young adults, right? And that's because these kids are staying longer in our program because they're asking us the question, what's next, right? How do I navigate to get a job? How do I fill out a FAFSA form to go to college? What's the process for enlistment, right? Oh, I have this idea about entrepreneurship, but I don't know where to start. They're looking for mentorship and connection. And what we're doing is saying, how do we now implement programs along with people in, in corporate America to say, well, can we engage and be a pipeline for both what young people and families need in terms of skill development, access and opportunities, and at the same time for companies and corporations who are saying, we want to reach young people, we want to reach certain communities, we want to reach them at a younger age, and we want to get our employees engaged in a very effective way. And can you help us to be a bridge? Artists, at the very beginning of a relationship, let's just say, you know, you're a, a little is starting or a big is starting. You've been part of the, you know, the fabric of, of this community for a long time, whether it's at Big Brothers or 4-H or now Big Brothers big sisters what's the top advice you give to a little beginning this process and what's the the advice you give to a big your personal your personal you know do's and don'ts yeah the advice that i give to a little is to say be yourself be be your authentic self that's what these relationships are about that that they're safe that you can feel the use your voice that you can feel empowered that we want you to to uh, step out to feel comfortable to share, to talk, to engage, but to be your authentic self in the relationship. And we know those, in those type of environments, that's the best way that our littles grow. Um, and I think that's really important for our, our families, for young people, for anyone who's who here, who's uh, thinking about a young person getting involved in our program, is to know that it's authentic, right? It's about being their, their authentic self, and we're gonna help them empower them, empower them through the connection of relationships. To bigs, to uh, volunteers, and to adults, what I would say is, and I've said this previously, is that you don't have to be perfect to be a mentor, right? You just have to be present and persistent. So many times people uh, look at the idea of mentorship, and I always um, say that, you know, you have these concepts of mentors that sometimes we see in popular culture, right? That they have to be these sort of uh, the Mr. Miyagi's, right? That they're, they're these like, you know, dynamic wisdom throwing and all those different things that you see when in reality, it's just one people who show up. It's going to listen. It's going to be a sounding board. Uh, it's going to be present in their lives. That's going to, you know, push productively and, and positively. Uh, that's going to listen to them. Right. And also that's going to exhibit vulnerability, right? That being perfect is actually a good being, not being perfect is actually a good thing, right? That you can tell and share with the kid what's your experience been like on something where you failed, where you made a mistake and how you learn from it and how you develop. So I will always say people to have that level of sensibility about working with kids, have a sense of vulnerability and have a sense of empathy, right? And I'll say that on both sides, the idea of empathy, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, right? So I think that's important for kids to do in the relationships they have. I think that's important for adults to do in the relationships they have. And that's what we find so often through Big Brothers, Big Sisters, because what I will share with you, it's so many, about 70% of our relationships um, are formed through different cultures, right? People from different backgrounds, different demographics. So kids from different demographics than the volunteers who they're with. And what we traditionally find, and we find this through research, is that it opens up the perspective of both individuals, right? The kids get access, opportunities to different worlds, but in the same way, the adults, their worlds expand. They see much more culturally, they get much more connected to their community. And that's why I think this is an organization that makes society better, right? It makes our communities better and it makes our country better. Well, artists, two years in the seat, a long runway ahead, a little bit of a tailwind from $122.6 million from Mackenzie Scott. So much ahead for you guys. Come back to the New York Stock Exchange. Ring the bell again. We'd love to have you back. Thanks so much for joining us inside the Ice House. Thank you, my friend. Take care, Josh. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Artis Stevens, president and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. 
If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Lauren Sullivan and Pete Ash. It's sound engineering and editing from Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 